Now it's time to hear the stories of Utes in their own words. This is Utes Insider presented by Pepsi. Here's your host, Mike Legaschult. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Utes Insider presented by Pepsi. Thanks for hopping on and great to have you with us as we work through the month of June. And boy, what a crazy time we are experiencing in our, our nations and really our world's history right now with the coronavirus outbreak and then the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis back on May 25th. And uh, like so many of us, I've been home at nights and you're watching the cable news shows, you're watching live video of the the protest taking place and, and updates on the situation with the coronavirus. And uh, while you're doing that during commercial breaks, you maybe hop on Facebook or some of the, the social media outlets. And I did that uh, a few weeks ago, hopped on Facebook and I, I'm Facebook friends with one of our former men's basketball players, Tim Drism, who during his time at the pro with the program wasn't our best player on those teams, but he was always a leader, always a guy who was prominently involved in, in how the team was doing and what they were doing. And I always kind of wondered what Tim is going to end up doing with his life. Cause he was a guy who was so bright and, and so willing to step forward and say what had to be said and, 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 and take things on. And, and he's now moved on to a uh, career as a basketball coach here in the Metro area. And he's been heavily involved in music his entire life. He was, uh, involved with the New Pilgrim Church when he was in college. It's now the point. He is their musical director at this point. And Tim and his brother Terrence released a song called Hold On. And his brother Terrence goes by the stage name Ernie. So they released this song on YouTube. And and Tim posted the song on his Facebook page. And I saw it. And and the, the lyrics just kind of connected with me as, as I listened to it. And I thought, what a great message for this day and age with everything going on. Uh, the simple message of just hold on, it was so powerful. So I reached out to Tim and I said, listen, I've got this new podcast. I've been wanting to have you on as a guest at some point just to talk about your playing career during the early 2000s. You had a Sweet 16 team, your junior season with Andrew Bogut. And just with his role, I thought he'd be a great guy to have on to sort of reminisce about Utah basketball. But I said with this song, I think the time to have you on is now. Let's talk about the Utes. Let's talk about what you're doing now in this song and, and just sort of what your life has been like since you left the Utah program. So Tim said, yep, let's do it. So he and I had a chance to connect uh, on June 10th, as we record this show, and, and Tim and I went back and talked about his career. He got into some personal things he experienced during his time at Utah and really how his time at Utah, how his time since he left the U has really shaped him into being the person who he is. Religion is very important to Tim, as is his music and his new song uh, really has brought those two things together. So it should be a fun conversation. I hope you enjoy it. And we'll catch up with Tim Drisdom in just a moment on Utes Insider, presented by Pepsi. To hear more episodes of this show and other Utah Athletics podcasts, search for them on iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube. Now, back to more of Utes Insider presented by Pepsi. Well, so pleased to be joined by uh, one of the all-time great guys in Utah basketball history, Tim Drisdom, who is now into the entertainment business as a music producer, performer. He works at the point as their musical director. He's also done some coaching and still is, in fact, at the high school level. And we're going to catch up with Tim on that as well as uh, look back at his career in the Crimson and White. Uh, Tim, thanks for joining us this afternoon. Hey, Mike. Thank you so much for having me, man. Before we get into what you're doing now, which uh, could be a show in itself, I thought we'd go back and sort of reintroduce you to people a little bit. It's been a while since you played for the Utes back in the early 2000s, and uh, you had a great run with those teams. In fact, three trips to the NCAA tournament and and uh, the, the Sweet 16 run with Andrew Bogut and crew back in 2004, 2005. But let's go back to how it all started for you. Uh, you grew up in the L.A. area, went to Calvary Chapel Christian School. You were a player of the year twice in your division in California, and then you came to Utah. What what led you to the U and who got you here to get the get your Utah career started? Yeah, so, um, yeah, like I said, I had, a, I had a pretty decent high school career, I would say, and um, was able to be recruited. Um, I, I thought I, my recruiting was, was pretty cool in terms of how many schools I was able to, um, you know, have an opportunity to go to. But what really led me here um, was, was really the coach, um, coach McGarrett at the time. Um, you know, and, and as far as how I played the game, um, I was pretty cerebral. You know, I thought the game, I wasn't the greatest athlete, you know, I wasn't the highest jumper or the most athletic. And, um, I saw what he was able to do with, um, with Andre Miller's career. And I thought, you know, I might have a chance to, to kind of follow suit. So, 
Um, I thought Utah would be the best uh, best choice for me. So here I there I came, here I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you came and you stayed, which is uh, really a great yeah. part of the story. Uh, who knew all the way back in you know two thousand uh, you know two thousand three when you came here that it'd be this long. But uh, yeah, you had a great career, Tim. Uh, I mean, there were. Uh, some great players with you, Andrew Bogut, who we'll talk about in a bit. He was the National Player of the Year in 04, 05. Uh, Nick Jacobson was around. Uh, Britton Johnson was around your freshman year. You played with some really, some really talented guys who made it to the next level. But you know, to me, you were you were even though not the best player in those teams, you were always a vital part of what was going on. As you mentioned, you were very cerebral, but you to me, you were always a leader. You were a guy who led uh, by example with uh, you know vocally. You were not afraid to speak up and talk, and and uh, especially with the guys that came from the LA area, like yourself, Richard Cheney, Bryant Marks, and a year later Justin Hawkins. You were you were kind of the ringleader with that group, and it just seemed like very quickly you became a leader of those teams. Maybe just talk about you know what they told you when you came to Utah in terms of hey, we've got a role for you as a leader. We want you to come. We see some things in you. What was that conversation like when you were trying to make a decision on where to go to college? Yeah, I, I actually, um, and most most kids probably would get turned off by um, you know Majerus's method of recruiting, um, but it was honest, and and I think that was that was the biggest thing for me. You know, he I asked him, you know, when I come in, you know, what's the plan? You know, do I have an opportunity to start? Do I have an opportunity to play right away? Um, and you know, he told me straight up, he said, you know, he <laughs> starting is for high school, you know, basically <laughs> like, that's, that's not what you need to necessarily be worried about, but he was very honest. Like, Hey, you know, I'm not giving you anything, you know, whatever you get, you're going to earn it, which, you know, I'm, I'm totally fine with that. Um, and so coming in, you know, but he, he had big, you know, big hopes for me in terms of having, a, you know, a, a complete career. And, and obviously, you know, I had aspirations of wanting to play at the next level and, and he thought that I could reach that. And I don't think that he, you know, that he was lying about that either. Um, I was, I was a little bit sad when he, when he left, but um, in terms of the plans, I mean, I, I thought that we were kind of on track. I had a decent, you know, first and second year at Utah and I was figuring it out. And obviously I played a, the, the toughest position on the floor. Um, it's demanding and um, you know, it's not super rewarding all the time in practice, you know? Um, and I've learned, you know, I learned in that, in that spell to just take responsibility for, Really, really for everything. Um, and I was okay with that. I was okay with, you know, when, when there was an issue or when there was a screw up or, you know, a turnover, even if I wasn't necessarily involved, I was okay with saying my bad. And that was on me because, you know, that was, that, that was what was expected of me. Um, and so I've learned to do that. And I think that is what, um, kind of garnered the respect of my teammate. You know, I was never really, I never really was a finger pointing guy. You know, I, I, I did right. my best to, communicate and make sure everybody was where they needed to be on the floor. Um, you know, repeat what, what was happening coming out of timeout. So, you know, you, you grow camaraderie and you grow the trust of your teammates to where, yeah, you can be vocal and you can say what's on your mind. So, um, I think that's what my career, um, ended up being. And, uh, and, and it kind of ushered me into the next part, you know, the next phase of my life, which, you know, now I'm coaching. So there's that. Yeah, you are one of several guys who played for him and under him and, and really coached with him who have gone on to to do some great things in the coaching ranks. But that that quote you just gave me, starting is for high school. If I've heard that once, I've heard it a million times from, <laughs> from guys who played for Coach Majerus because that was his thing. He's like, starting doesn't matter, and you have to earn everything. You know, let's be honest, Tim, he wasn't the easiest guy to play for. Uh, he was demanding, uh, especially of his point guards. And uh, he, he pushed Andre Miller, and Andre responded and, and did great things. He pushed Keith Van Horn. He pushed a lot of guys to the max. And, and I know you were in that same category because he saw great things in you. Um, what was it like to play for him? Because, I mean, you knew what you were getting into. Yep. Um, you, you, you talked to enough guys that did your research, but still when you experienced it and, and you're pushed the way he pushes guys, I know it could be tough. Uh, it's not for everybody, but the results speak for themselves in terms of his record when he was here. Guys, like I said, he went on to to play at the next level, to be coaches themselves, assistant coaches who've gone on to become college coaches who who learned a ton from him as a player yeah. during those two years you had with him. What was what was it like on a, on a daily basis? Yeah, I mean, um, I would be lying if I if I didn't say it was hard. You know, it was it yeah. was very hard. It was um, it was physically taxing, and it was also probably more than anything. It was more mentally taxing than anything. Um, you know, like I said, he had a, 
first of all, he's a genius of a basketball mind. Um, he, he just yep. he just knew his stuff, and uh, and and he had a way of communicating it, and um, you know he had his way of of doing it all, and it was something to try to get adjusted to, you know, where um, a, a bigger guy tells you you're out of shape every day, you know, a guy <laughs> who <laughs> who doesn't seem like he should be the one giving you fitness advice, right, um, right, you know. <laughs> Like that, like it's you know, and for and for me, like I understood it. I understood what he was trying to do, and and there were times where I would just kind of smirk and 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 just kind of keep it moving. But um, <laughs> it was hard because he knew what he was doing. You know, you 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 started picking up on the fact that like, okay, he's gonna he's gonna see how far he can push, yep. and this is what this is. I think if you took that out of context and you were just feeling like you were just being picked on, and he didn't like you or he didn't care about you. Um, then, then it, then it, you know, it kind of went the way that it did for guys like that. Um, but for me, I understood that he was just trying to get it out of me. He was trying to see how far he could push me before I broke down or before I quit or before whatever. He wanted to see who he had. And I think that's important. I think, you know, I don't always agree with the method and I, and you know, and, and some people may not always agree with my method or your method. Um, but at the end of the day, I think what was communicated was that he actually did care. Yep. And he, he actually did have a heart for the guys that, that he recruited and that, and that, you know, earned his respect by working hard, um, yep. which is really all that he wanted. He wanted you to work your butt off and he wanted you to be smart. He wanted you to graduate. You know, they, there were things like that that don't get talked about very much, but he had a, he had a huge passion for those, those guys graduating. Like he wanted you to finish your degree. He wanted you to go to class. You know, he, he wanted you to develop a relationship with teachers and, is those things were always encouraged, you know, and, and those things happened behind the scenes and he didn't get, I don't think he got enough credit um, for what, you know, the student athletes there were able to do under his tutelage. Um, the guys like Byron Wilson and Dre and, and Van Horn and Doliak. I mean, all those guys, Trace Caton and Nick Jacobs. I mean, you, the list goes on and on, um, you know, myself and Brian and, and Rich. I mean, we're all, you know, college graduates, yep. you know, um, and, and, and that's a, that's a big, uh, tribute to, to who he also was um, as a coach. Yeah, I want to be fair, Tib, and kind of go with uh, the, the tough day-to-day part first and then get to the rest of what you led to already is, you know, people maybe didn't see the kind things he did, the, the, the amount of caring he had for his players, the things he would do for people who yeah. really had no ties to him, but he would do great stuff for them all the time anyway, and, and no one knew about it. So it, it seemed to me guys like you who could see the big picture and realize, okay, this is tough in the moment, but I know what he's trying to do. I, I see the good. I, I see the toughness. I see the complete picture, the complete person uh, of who Rick Majerus was. And, and those are the guys who made it. And you were one of those guys who really seemed to kind of get the whole thing and, and laugh some things off and, and let it roll off your back a little bit and, and not let it get to you. And, and, and guys like you did well, and you obviously did, you came in right away and started, uh, at point guard, which is not easy to do as a college freshman, especially in Rick Majerus' system. But like I said, you brought some guys with you. I know when we signed you and Richard Cheney and Bryant Markson that, you know, that was that was a big deal uh, to, to get to the three of you here. And then Justin Hawkins came a year later. So with those other yeah. three guys, how involved were you in, in saying, hey, guys, we can all go together and do this thing at Utah? Were you were you kind of heavily involved in, in sort of recruiting those other three or did those three just kind of do that more or less on their own? Yeah, so me and um, me and Bryant and Justin, we all play for the same AAU organization. It's called the LA Rockfish. Yep. Um, and actually, Utah was actually one of the later schools that came on. And I'll never forget it. Bryant, um, who had dealt with some knee issues, he had torn his ACL. So we were in Vegas to play a tournament, and, um, and he couldn't play. And we were just sitting there talking about our recruiting. All of a sudden, we get a phone call in the room. And, um, you know, it's, it's my AU coach telling me that Utah, you know, wants to offer me and all that. And I got off the phone and Brian was in the room laying on the floor and he was like, um, who was that Utah? And I was like, yeah, he was like, I think they, I think they recruit me too. And I was like, cool. And he was like, all right, wherever you go, I go. <laughs> and it was that simple. Like it was, and I thought he was just joking until I committed to Utah and <laughs> shortly after, uh, Brian committed. And then we were coming back from that trip in Vegas. And um, we we actually it was it was crazy. It was, that was some of the funnest times out, now that I think about it. But we were getting off the van coming from Vegas, going right into another tournament in L.A. And I walked into the gym, 
and Richard Cheney was in there, and his mm-hmm. team was getting ready to play. And I, I've known Rich since we were in the first grade. So, um, you know, we, we kind of grew up together and got separated and then, again, you know, got, got back together in high school. But uh, walked in, and Rich, uh, he, he said, hey, so are you going to USC? Because everybody had heard that, you know, there was like an unofficial visit or whatever. And I was like, no, I think I'm going to go to Utah. He was like, really? He was like, Utah's recruiting me too. And I was like, where is I said, Brian's going. He was like, well, I'm coming too. And it was like, it was just that simple. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it, it wasn't even like, like they needed to, you know, they didn't need to convince Rich and Brian to come. Um, and I think those guys just came because they knew I passed the ball. They knew yep. I would pass. So, um, <laughs> you know, we, we had a great relationship that way. And then I've known Justin since, you know, he was in, I think, the fifth or sixth grade. We played on the team together, a YMCA team together. And, um, you know, I was able to stay in touch with him. And, and then that next year, you know, they were able to recruit him as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I guess you can say I played a part in it. I, but everybody was doing it selfishly. They just did it because they knew Tim would pass the ball. <laughs> well, it worked out great for all of you. Uh, you guys had the nickname, the original three, Run DMC. You know, and yeah. then we, I, I joked with you one time, you had an H in year, in year two for you guys to get Hawkins in here with Cheney and uh, Drizzm and Markson. And, and you guys, I tell you what, the four of you played a lot of big minutes for this Utah basketball program back in the early 2000s. So let's kind of run down your career, Tim. As I mentioned, you came in from day one. You started your first year. You guys got to the second round of NCAAs in 0203. I remember you guys beat Oregon in one of those classic 8-9 games in the first round of the NCAAs in Nashville. And Richard Cheney said the night before he had a dream that the game ended. He was holding the ball. And that's exactly how the game ended. It was a crazy finish. He got the ball and just wrapped both arms around it like it was, you know, uh, the most yeah. cherished possession that he's ever had his entire life. And you guys run to the locker room and you celebrate. And it was just such a great win. Uh, talk yeah. about that freshman season. You know, again, you and and Cheney and Markson came in here. All three of you played a lot that first year. Uh, you know, Rick Majerus had some health issues a couple years before them, but came back. And that was a team that really came together. Uh, Britton Johnson was uh, a senior. Um, also, we had uh, Trace Caton on that team. It, w- it was a really, really good team that uh, won a Mountain West regular season championship as well. Just talk about that freshman year and what stands out to you as you look back at it. Yeah, I mean, um, that was that was a cool year. And I'm going to get back to that, uh, that Oregon game because I, I thought that was one of the hardest but like coolest experiences of my life. But yeah, that year, man, coming in and I remember um, going going to a preseason workout with uh, with Nick. We were walking um, at that point, walking to his car because he was giving us all a ride to the, the Smith Center at the time. Yep. Um, to, to lift weights, and um, I, I asked him, I said, "Hey, Nick, like, what do you think the biggest transition is from high school to college? Like, what do you think? What do you think I need to know that most guys don't hear walking into you know walking into their freshman year?" He was like, "Honestly, Tim." you really don't know how hard you have to play until you play in the game. That was the biggest thing. Like you don't know how hard you actually have to play the game. Wow. And I was just like, really? You know, I thought I played hard. You know, I, I'm, everybody thinks they played hard until you go play for coach, <laughs> you know, and you wonder why these like amazing athletes never get like these showtime dunks because we don't have any legs. Cause we're staying in the stands and we're on defense and we're, you know, we're closing out. We're, st- I mean, we're in the stands. I feel like we, we walk into practice and as soon as we're in practice, we're in the defensive stands. I've never been in the stands <laughs> that much in my entire life. Uh, not before and not since, but, um, that year was just, it was an incredible year. It was, it was a year of learning. Um, it was a year of competition. I remember, and he's my good friend now. I just got a text from him a couple of days ago, Mark Jackson. Yeah. Um, one of the toughest competitors that I have ever seen anywhere. Just a, just a competitor, fierce. Um, strong, determined. He's the guy, you know, they, they, the guys talk about, you know, we, we want to play with him every time, but we never want to play against him. We hate him if you got to be against him. Right. And um, I was fortunate enough to have him as, you know, the guy that I, that I competed with um, for that spot. And, um, and, and, and I, and I know that I earned it. He knows that I earned it, but it ended up being such an, like an amazing friendship and career that we had together because we kind of carried the load and, and we saw the, we kind of saw coach the same way, if if you will, mm-hmm. um, where he was, you know, he was extremely hard on both of us that year. And, um, and, and we, you know, we, we were together, we were together with it. So, um, you know, you guys like Britton Johnson, who, like I said, we're still friends today. 
um, you know, who had an, in, he kind of had a unfortunate part to that, to that season. I think that's the year he broke his thumb and had mono and right. there's all kind of stuff that kind of went wrong for him that year. Um, but just a really great friend, Nick Jacobson, again, I spoke, spoke about him earlier. Um, but just like he was, I mean, he's one of the most amazing shooters that I've ever been around. He's one of the hardest workers I've ever been around that, I mean, he doesn't have a lot of, you know, he never had a lot of, you know, craziness to his game, but he just got stuff done. Um, and he was another one. He was another fierce competitor. Um, you know, you had Tim Frost, you had, you know, Chris Jackson, yep. big red, um, you know, that year and Trace K, Trace K and which, I mean, <laughs> that guy, everybody was always jealous of his body, you know, in the weight room, he was just undefeated. Yes. Um, you know, <laughs> he, he did his thing. So that year, I mean, you know, and we had a great coaching staff, you know, and I think a lot of times, you know, when you have a great coach, a lot of, a lot of times, sometimes the assistants get kind of the, the, the brunt of it or kind of get lost in the, in the conversation. But guys like Eric Jackson and Scott Garson and, um, Sylvie Dominguez and those guys and the list goes on. Um, and so just getting, just getting acclimated my first year, um, and to get all the way to the tournament, um, and then to have Oregon as our first round game. I remember the practice that we had preparing for Oregon. We, we, we did impossible drills. <laughs> that, that required us to get back on defense. And it was like, you couldn't ever get back. You right. just never could get back. But coach put you in a situation where you almost could not succeed so that you, you, like you were just so ready to play. We were so ready to play that game. And I remember he was really, really hard on the freshman um, in preparation for that game. And, and he said some things that we'll never forget, but we <laughs> ended up on the floor. We ended up on the floor in crunch time of that game. I think um, Trace fouled out and, Somebody else fouled out, but me, Rich, and Brian ended up on the floor in that Oregon game and was able to, you know, with the help of the other two guys, to, to bring that game home. And it was one of the sweetest feelings that we've ever had. Um, because the biggest thing coaches tell us is that, you know, if we lose this game, it's going to be because of you three. And we actually won. <laughs> we actually won that game because of us three. So um, it was really dope. Really, really a great year. My first year, was, it, was, it was really cool. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. Britton had the thumb injury and then the mono late in the year and he missed some time. And, and, uh, Trace Caton, uh, was, as you said, he was uh, just in great, tremendous shape and he was wrapping things up. So from that year, we go to your sophomore season and, and Britton and Trace leave, uh, they graduated. Britton had a chance at the NBA, made the, the roster with Orlando, I believe, for a little bit. Uh, shortly thereafter, yep. Mark Jackson decided he was going to hang it up. He was moving into family business, and and uh, just yeah. it wasn't working out with him and coach, and and so he leaves. But you know that that old three oh four season, Tim, you had Nick Jacobson back. He was a senior. Yeah. You got Andrew Bogut to come from Australia, and he was a guy that people just could not wait to 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 have. And and then he said uh, as well that you three freshmen. Cheney, Markson, and yourself closed out that tournament win in uh, 03. You three were back. You had Justin Hawkins there. And that 03 04 season, just an interesting year because, as it turned out, Coach Majerus stepped down before the year was done. Uh, his health was was not great at that point in his career, and and he, he did not finish the year. In fact, Kerry Rupp took over as the interim head coach. You guys went five and four under him. I thought Kerry did a great job just kind of keeping that whole thing afloat. And you guys won some games uh, again, five and four to close out the regular season. Then you go to the tournament in Denver, you get three wins there to make NCAAs and uh, Nick at the game winner over UNLV from the left wing in that tournament championship game to win it. We go play Boston college in Milwaukee, lose that one. But I thought for that team, to win the Mountain West tournament, just to hold it together the way you guys did, and that old three oh four season to me was just a, a tremendous accomplishment in itself. Let alone making NCAA's. What do you remember as you look back now of that sophomore season? Yeah, like you said, I mean it was a little bit of a weird year. Yeah, and um, you know coming into it, we had some pretty um, pretty high hopes for that year. You know, we all the, the freshmen had a a year under their belt and, and a year in the system and, and really starting to understand it and, and understood what it means to buy in, what it meant to buy in. And then, you know, being able to get Hawk that year and, and be able to get Drew that year um, to add, you know, to go alongside Tim Frost and, and Jacobson and, and a couple other guys. I mean, we thought like that was a, that was a, that was a pretty special team and had a chance to be really, really special. Um, you know, I remember the day that, um, that we found out coach wasn't coming back. 
and uh, we all it was a morning and we were all in class or i hope all of us were in class we're supposed to be anyway. um, <laughs> that's your story but, you're sticking uh, with it uh you that's know my, well i mean they, they found me pretty quick i think they found me <laughs> on campus which is good yes it's you were on campus at least time. there you go there you go yeah, I, was, I was at least on campus but um, i remember going into that conference room and and and, and having coach on on the speakerphone and, and kind of sharing with us where he was with things and and, and that he wouldn't you know finish the season and, and i just remember that kind of the hit that um that we felt in the room. Um and, and it wasn't it wasn't really because um because we thought we weren't gonna be good afterwards. You know, like I said, those those assistants don't get enough credit. We can talk about culture up again here, you know, uh in a second. But I I just, you know, it's like you lose I don't know, he never played a game for us. But he was always a part of everything. And as much as we as much as it was a challenge and it was, you know, as much as I had nightmares almost every day as a freshman of practice the next day. Um, you know, as, as many alarms as I had to set because I just needed to wake myself up and try to break up my dream so I could try to make a dream about something else. Um, it, it was just, it was just one of those things that you're just like, man, like, okay, what now? You know, what, what, where do we go from here? Um, but it actually really spoke to the leadership that, that Nick provided, that Tim provided, um, that coach Rupp and, and, and coach E and, all of those guys provided um, where we were able to pick up the pieces in a sense and, um, and just rally, you know, and, and, and figure it out for the rest of the year. Um, you know, I didn't know what that would look like after my sophomore season. Um, you know, I, I wasn't, I mean, I, at that point I had fallen in love with Utah. I, had, I was already a member of a, of a really, really dope church that I loved and, and was a part of musically. And so, there was a lot of things that were that were going well, um, and I even even as a player, like you know, what I was learning is that once you know every every year it gets better with coach. Yeah, you know, he he trusts you more. Um, he kind of he kind of switches gears toward like he started switching gears even before he left. Um, in my sophomore season, um, he, he started switching with me and, and really you know showing me that he trusted me and and really you know coming to my coming to my defense on a lot of uh, you know on a lot of things. And, and that sort of thing. So um, I was kind of lost after that year, but like you said, we finished that year. I remember that that game at the Pepsi Center um, coming to the huddle. We knew exactly exactly what play you wanted to run. We knew exactly who you wanted to shoot the ball, and um, and, and it worked out perfectly. And it, it was it was a tremendous year. I was super proud of our guys. Super proud of of what Coach Rep did and, and his leadership. Um, you know, and then going on to. I think we lost by four, and, and Nick Jacobson probably had the worst shooting night probably to date of his life. Yep. You know, I remember him. Yep. He was like one for 10 in the first half from three, and he was like three for 20 or something like that for that game. And, um, it was just like, and he got great shots. You know, it, they just didn't go in. Just didn't and go so that day. Like, they just, yeah, it just didn't go, you know, and, and, and it sucked that that was the, that was the game that, that, that happened. But, um, you know, I think the fact that he got 20 shots shows how much we had confidence in him. Um, you know, to shoot that ball over and over again. But yeah, that year was, it was like I said, it was it was weird. But it were there were a lot of highlights and a lot of great moments that that we'll be able to take with us. You know, I want to go back to when Coach Majera stepped down. It's such an interesting dichotomy because he was difficult, but at the same time, all of you guys came here to play for him. And guys like yourself yeah. and guys who made it through and understood the process he was putting you through really embraced what was going on as tough as it could be at times. Like you said, the, the waking up in the night and, and, and having nightmares about this and that, but you, you, but you knew that was part of the deal and you saw the results when he stepped down. It was such a shock to all of us. Cause all of a sudden, I mean, we were over uh, on a road trip the weekend before, I think we played New Mexico and air force and lost both games. Yep. I want to say, and he, it just, things were not going well at that point in the season. And, and, and coach had had some health issues and, yeah, I told people after the fact he didn't look good. I mean, just the stress of everything was was weighing on him heavily. Yeah. And when I heard he was stepping down, I'm like, you know, in some ways I'm not surprised. Um, but it was it was still a shock to all of us when it happened. When you heard it again, kind of take us back to that. What was that moment like? As I said, everybody came to play for him, and then he was just gone. I mean, what was that like to lose your coach? Yeah, you know, at that point in the season. Yeah, like I said, I mean, it was it was you know. It was really heartbreaking, to be yeah. honest. Um, it was the reason why we came. It was definitely the reason why I came. Um, I literally picked Utah because of the coach. Yeah, you know, um, I was, I was, like I said, I was pretty highly recruited and and had a, a chance to to pretty much get anywhere I wanted to go. 
and I picked this place, this school. I remember my mom, <laughs> she cried like big tears because out of all the schools and out of all the cities I could have ended up in, she just couldn't figure out why it was Salt Lake. You know, why, why would you want to go to Salt Lake City, Utah? Like, you don't even know where that is, really. Um, but so that was the reason why I came. And so when he left, um, there were just a lot of questions that I had about, um, you know, what does the future look like? What does my personal future look like? Um, you know, he's the guy who I trusted with my career. Um, you know, and so when he walked away, it was, it was heartbreaking. I also remember, um, there was a game that year we played at Colorado and, um, I think it was, yeah, it was at Colorado. And, um, I remember at halftime of that game, um, we were, I think we were down, we weren't down huge, but we were down. And I remember him coming into the locker room. He usually waits, but he came right into the locker room. And um, he started like yelling and he was going at a particular player, going at him really, really hard. And then all of a sudden, like you saw him get pale mm-hmm. and, and he, and he was like, he took a pause and he just said water and was like reaching back for something to kind of lean in, like lean back on because he had just stressed himself out to the point where he was getting ready to pass out. And yeah. we're like, I mean, I'm sitting in the, I'm sitting in the front thinking like, okay, coach is about to die in front of us. He's got to calm down. Um, and so in that moment, I'll never forget because it made the rest of it make sense. Yep. Um, you know, I think he, he loved the game and you can, and you can see it. I mean, he, he bled basketball, you know, he, he was all about the game. He, he saw it in a, in a way that I don't think I've met anybody else who has seen it that way. And so, um, I also knew how much the game meant to him even in, in, in him having to leave and in, in him having to step away. And so to kind of like not be selfish, like I wanted to like make sure that he was okay too. Um, because it was something that he had to step away from that, you know, he had to step away. I mean, he had to step away from something he really, really loved. And so I knew that it had to be, you know, it had, it was something he had to do or he yep. wouldn't have stepped away. So, um, but yeah, it was, it was heartbreaking. It was, it was, a. It was a hard thing to deal with. And uh, like I said, you know, kudos to the guys who, who kind of picked up the pieces and, and, um, and made sure that the morale of the, of the deal was kept and, and, and we just kept competing and, and had a, and finished off, like you said, five and four, um, and, and, and had an, another opportunity to, to play for, you know, to play in that tournament, which is, which is well, which was, which, I mean, that was the goal anyway. So we yeah. were able to achieve that. Yeah, you sure did. Eight and five was your record under Kerry Rupp. You mentioned Kerry. You know, also on the staff at that time, Jeff Strom was an assistant. Tom Abadamarco. Uh, you mentioned Eric Jackson. Scott Garson was a guy who was you know, came as a GA, and and I think after Majerus stepped down, Scott got a chance to step in and, and do some more on the coaching side. But Kerry Rupp, a former high school coach at East High School, and and was uh, brought on by Coach Majerus, and and when. Uh, Majerus stepped down. Rupp was the guy who took over, and and just such to me, he was such a calming presence. He was kind of the guy that could kind of smooth things over when it wasn't going well, and just knew basketball inside and out. In fact, he was a guy who was involved in in changing the offense. They went to a, a two a double high post offense with with Bogut and and Tim Frost that uh, that Kerry was involved in in getting some research done on to to bring back to Coach Majerus. So. You know, for a guy who wasn't around uh, the program and around college that long, he really quickly rose up and was, I thought, the perfect guy to lead the team the rest of that season. You know, as you look back at, at your memories of Coach Rupp and, and that that run uh, to finish up the old three, or let me that the old four, yeah, the old three oh four season. What what memories do you have of of Kerry Rupp? Coach Rupp was, um, I mean, that's off the basketball court. Coach Rupp is probably the coolest white guy I've ever met <laughs> <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm, I'm sure you know in this climate it, people are like what, did he just say white guy now it's well yeah, put it's um, well put because I, I yeah, know Kerry and I, yeah. I know exactly where you're going with that yep <laughs> listen I'm, I mean the best dress yes the, you know what I'm saying I mean his yes. swag yes was just through the roof he, he, <laughs> he just exuded confidence you know what I'm saying and and he had the, he had a very unique ability to relate and to he's got he's kind of like that that perfect balance of players coach and whatever the other thing is you know where he, he just he, he, he's demanding he wants it all he, he can be intense but at the same time like you like him at the same time 
Yeah. Which, you know, that's a gift. Um, he's, he's very, very, very basketball savvy, understands the game. Um, you could tell he was an amazing high school coach, you know, at East, at East High School, local guy. But um, we all, like, it wasn't that we, like, we didn't have any doubts that he was going to be great. Like, it wasn't like, oh, oh man, you know, we're going to, we're going to fall off because now we have a guy who doesn't know what he's doing. Right. That was not the sense. That was not the sentiment at all. Um, and I do remember, you know, going in and after the season was over, you know, there were some guys who, who knew they were coming back or, or thinking about coming back that, you know, we petitioned to, to the AD and just said, Hey, you know, if, if we can, we want to have coach, we want to have coach Rupp back. You know, we want to, we want to be able to play with this staff, you know, for the years to come. And unfortunately that didn't happen, but that's how much, we value coach Rupp. Yeah. You know, that's how much we wanted. That's how much we wanted him around where we got a group of guys. and just like, Hey, you know, let's, let's just keep this thing going because I think we can still be good. Yeah. And, and, and I think he's the guy that could, that could get us where we, where we planned on going in the first place type of thing. So, um, but yeah, just a terrific coach, great family. I love his wife, Lori and all the kids. Like they were just, they were just really, really tremendous and, re- and really dynamic and, in, in taking over. Um, and, you know, and taking over that year, and 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 obviously went on to be successful, and still and still and still a, su- a successful coach. Um, yeah. Today, so yeah, he's awesome. You're right. Uh, at that point, Kerry, as I mentioned, so new to college coaching, had not been a head coach. I think at that point, Chris Hill, the AD, thought, you know what, I got to get someone with some more experience who's been through it before as a head coach and taking over for Rick Majerus. That's those are big shoes to fill, uh, you know. So he went a different route and hired. Ray Jack Luddy, and as I worked out for Kerry Rupp, he went to be an assistant coach at Indiana and then became a head coach at Louisiana Tech, and now he's an assistant coach at Oregon State under Wayne Tinkle. And, and uh, as you said, doing some great things. He's had a great run uh, through the college coaching ranks. But let's talk about that offseason, Tim. As we mentioned, Rick Majera stepped down, and you guys made the tournament, and, and Ray Jack Luddy was hired as the head coach going into that 4 5 season, and there were some questions who stays, who goes? Andrew Bogut had a great freshman year. In fact, was the Mountain West Conference Freshman of the Year. Uh, some thoughts were, hey, if if you know if if Kerry Rupp doesn't stay, maybe Bogut goes because they they were that tight. And Bogut decided to stay. Uh, you decided to stay. A lot of those guys stuck around. And in fact, Mark Jackson, who took the previous year off and. 0304 decided to come back and play one more year for Ray Jack Luddy, which turned out to be a, a huge get for Ray to, to get that team kind of put back together in 0405. Talk to us about that offseason, just with kind of the, the questions of where's the program going? Who's our new head coach? How's this going to work out? What was kind of the conversations and the thoughts, you know, amongst yourself and the players during that offseason? Oh, uh, I think they were mixed. I think they were mixed. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think um, I don't think everybody was bought in mm-hmm. to that. Like I said, we went in, we went in and, and had a conversation with Chris Hill, and and it didn't go the way that we you know wanted it to go. Um, but we had still grown to love the place. We had grown to love the fans. We'd still come off a successful season, so there wasn't really um, a lot of reason, you know, justifiable reason. I mean, I guess Coach Levin is a pretty big reason to leave, but. Um, there wasn't a lot of justifiable reasons to just pick up shit, you know, pack up shit and just go. Yeah. Um, I think Mark, Mark coming back was huge. I think that, that was great for everybody. I think everybody was excited to have him back. Um, obviously with Drew coming back that, I mean, we, we were going to be contenders no matter what, cause he was, you know, he was what he was. He was and, special. Um, and, and he was super special. And so, um, you know, I remember that off season, me and Andrew actually decided to get a, to get an apartment together for that next year. And so, um, you know, we had some conversations about how it could be and, and that, and, and he was, I mean, he was, a, he was a hard worker. I mean, he just worked his butt off all the time. Um, but yeah, it was just, it was a different deal, a different philosophy coming in, you know, different assistants. And I mean, everything was different. I think we did a good job of, of embracing that, um, and getting out of that, that next year, um, you know, getting out of the next year, what I feel like we, what we should have got. Um, and, and having the, and having the year that we did, and I mean, it didn't come without a cost, that's for sure. Um, because, you know, with every transition, especially those that, that are that big, um, you know, there's, 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 it comes at a cost and it, it doesn't come without friction or without misunderstandings. And, you know, guys are getting to know each other and, and players are getting to know coaches and, you know, trying to figure all that stuff out. So, um, you know, yeah, that, that off season was, 
it was interesting. It mm-hmm. was interesting. It was hard for me. It, it was hard for me initially to get going um, because I don't think I really, I don't think I really understood what had happened that prior season until it all was over. Right. You know, I was kind of like, you know, when somebody passes away, you know what I'm saying? You, you get the, all through the, the grave site and all that stuff. And then it's the aftermath when people stop calling and people stop thinking about you or whatever that you kind of like settle into the new reality. Um, and, and that's kind of what that off season was at least for the first half. But of course, like in any other off season, we, we, we kicked it in gear and, and then we were ready to start that year. You know, you made a good point. I felt like in that 04, 05 season, the players really took control of the team. And, uh, you know, transition yeah. is always tough. Whenever you go from one coach to the next, almost regardless of what the record was, good or bad or in between, it's always tough. And especially it's 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 tough to replace a guy like Rick Majerus, who was such a big presence to, to go from that to anyone would have been difficult, but um, you mentioned you and Andrew became roommates. I remember that, and I thought you guys definitely, you know, the, as I said, the players to me sort of took control of that team. They started to drive things, but you and Andrew were really the callus behind that process. Uh, it's it's crazy how yeah. you know Andrew from Australia, you from California, and, and you guys just bonded and and became roommates. Just talk a little bit about your relationship with Andrew and and being roommates with him, and just yeah. kind of what that time was like for you, because that was that was just quite a deal the way you two like I said, came together and, and really drove that team that year. No, for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, he, uh, he I kind of took to him pretty early when he came. Um, matter of fact, his, his first year, uh, he actually came home with me for Christmas. And uh, my, my parents had to get him like an extended bed and the whole deal because <laughs> we didn't have any seven-footers in our family. Right, but, um, right. You know, I knew he was from another place. And um, I've kind of always been the guy that, you know, kind of related with everybody, you know, was able to get along with everyone, um, was able to see past differences and things of that nature. And, and, um, and, and, and so I, that's what that was. That's what that relationship was kind of built off of. Um, and then we got played together cause it just made sense. And, uh, that was interesting cause we had different tastes in everything. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and so there was, there was that, um, there was 5 AM, um, techno music being played in the, in the apartment. Oh wow! Um, while we were yeah, while we were getting ready to to um to go to early morning workouts, and so um yeah, there was there was a lot of there was a lot of there were a lot of differences. There were a lot of differences between me and Andrew, but uh, <laughs> we figured it out, and uh and and we figured out how to how to cohabitate. Yep. And uh, yeah, and and I think obviously that that was a a, a great um that helped in 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 how we um were a part of leading the team. Um, because we were able to have conversations that that um, kind of were offline, and that we could extend all the way to the house. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I mean that that was definitely, uh, I think, part of what made what made that leadership team, if you will. And I think Mark Jackson obviously played a big part in that as well. Um, you know, but but really leading that team, I think that played a played a big part in it. Yeah, I remember that. And, uh, you know, Mark Jackson, as we mentioned, came back. He was a senior, but he was married at that point and and just was kind yeah. of transitioning to that that next stage of his life already. It was, it was you and Andrew who you were guys who were still single and, and had time to hang out and really, really foster the cohesiveness for that team. I look back at that year, Tim, it didn't start out great. I mean, you know, we had Bogut and I know he played in the uh, FIBA tournament that summer before and Ray Jack Letty told me, he's like, mm-hmm. Hey, listen, he's probably gone after this year. He's going to be like a top 10 pick. And as the year played out, his numbers were, were off the charts and, and pro scouts were telling me, yeah, he's yeah. probably going to be top three. And, and he went on to be the first consensus national player of the year in school history and, and just did so much but that team took a while to come together I remember losing down in Arizona in the season but it seemed like right around uh between Christmas and New Year's in fact uh I was down at the Fiesta Bowl with the football team but you guys just drilled Colorado at home yeah. and uh it yeah. seemed like from that point on and he also took care of LSU uh and then went into the conference play but it seemed like that that late December Early January period, that team came together, and in conference play, it was a different group. I, I know there was a new head coach. Everyone's trying to come together. As you remember that stretch, Tim, what what helped the team gel at that point in the season and, and go on to have the the record you did, which was which was twenty nine and six. It was a great run. What what helped that team come together at that point? Yeah, I remember. Um, I remember the loss to Utah State. Yep. at the spectrum. 
Yeah. Um, we, we got, I mean, the 71, game was 71, the 71 45 that night. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The game was over in the first half. I think JC Carroll had 30 at halftime or something crazy. Like he yep. was just out of his mind. And when that place gets loud, you can forget it. Um, and I remember that loss and um, how embarrassing it was. And I just remember having conversation. It wasn't like a like deep, like, you know, team meeting stuff. You know, it was like, everybody was just like, what kind, of, like, what kind of year do we want to have? Because if, if we want to have a good year, if we want to have the year we're supposed to have, then, then this, this can't, I mean, we have to change. And I think everybody was committed to that. Um, I think we forgot about that loss in the sense of like, we didn't let that define us, but we did let it, we did let it light a fire under us because we're all competitors. Um, and then defensively, I just thought we, we, that was probably the biggest turn, you know, where we just, we just got a little bit more selfish defensively, a little more stingy. Um, and, and, you know, that's when you start seeing, you know, Mark Jackson diving on the floor behind guys as they're dribbling up the court. And I mean, he just, there's just a lot of different things that we would see a lot more of, you know, um, that, I mean, I remember that, that stretch, especially against Colorado and, and, um, and, and LSU where I was a little more aggressive offensively to shoot the ball when, when they would give me opportunities. And, you know, we realized that there was just, there was just more to be done and we didn't want it to go the way that it was going. Um, and so, yeah, we turned it around and I think we won like 19 straight or something like that. Crazy 18 or 19 in a row. Um, yeah. And, and from there, I mean, yeah, it was, it was, it was pretty impressive. It was pretty impressive. Pretty yeah. incredible. Yeah. I mentioned the loss, uh, at Arizona, but you guys played pretty well in that game. That was a good Arizona team. And then, yeah. as you mentioned, you beat, uh, Northern Colorado, Coppin state, Cal Poly, Weber, Colorado, LSU, and, and, and Whitworth. And, and yeah, it was a nice run after that loss, to Arizona, you guys went in conference play that year, 13 and one, you wrapped up the conference championship with a win at air force, on a Wednesday or a Thursday yep. night, we went down to the pit in Albuquerque and New Mexico uh, was right there atop the conference with the Utes that year. And in fact, uh, New Mexico uh, beat Utah in the Mountain West Tournament Championship game. But that was a, a very talented uh, New Mexico team. I believe Danny Granger was their, their star player that year. Yep. And uh, But a, a terrific run, as you said. It was a, a great stretch, 13-1 uh, and one in conference play. Off to NCAA's, and uh, you guys were assigned games in in Tucson. You beat UTEP in the first round, and and then got uh, I believe it was a, a three six matchup uh, in the in the second round against Oklahoma. And Oklahoma, yeah, yeah, you guys put play, just played one of the best games I've seen a Utah team play in the tournament. Sixty seven. 56, uh, I believe, was the final score in that one. And and Bogus passing was off the charts. And uh, you guys play great. Um, it's, I'll tell you what, getting to Sweet 16 any year is a huge accomplishment. And, and for you guys to, yeah. to to do what you did, uh, what stands out about kind of that run through March with that group? Um, It was fun. It was really fun. Um, for me personally, it was really dope. That was actually – so I, we always play in a tournament game on my birthday. That's always like how it had been. I mean, the first three years, it's always been March 21st. Um, and so I remember my parent, uh, my mom and my godmom surprised me in Arizona and uh, they, they took a road trip and came down and wow. took me to breakfast on my birthday and all of that. So that was pretty dope. But just getting those wins, I remember playing against UTEP and, and they were tough. I mean, they had yep. the, the really good guard from, I think Puerto Rico. Um, I want to say that's where he was from Riviera, Rivera or something like that. Um, but he was he was really tough, and uh, that was a tough game. The Oklahoma game was just, I mean, like you said, Bogut, Bogut passing the ball was just, I mean, he was always a, kind of, a, to me, an underrated, or not really underrated passer, but that was the part of his game that was really special that maybe didn't get as much credit as the rest of it. But really, really just, I mean, we, we I just remember, you know, back cutting and dunking those guys and, and really playing out our game plan, um, you know, to the, to the fullest extent. And um, and having a ton of confidence to uh, to come in and beat that really really talented Oklahoma team that um, I don't I don't think a lot of people thought we'd beat them to be honest. Not many um, did. No. Know, they were, yeah, they were, they were pretty special. Um, we were really athletic, and I actually remember getting my shot blocked off the backboard. I think early in that game, I mean, he, <laughs> forget who it was. It was a lefty guard, and he just came out of nowhere and just off the. I said, "Whoa, oh, this is going to be 
this is going to be tough. I'm still not athletic, huh? That's tough. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but it was a great, it was a great win. And, uh, the little guard, I, I'll never forget. There was a picture that came out from that game where, um, we're, uh, shaking their hands and he's a smaller guy. I forget, I forget his name. It was a little point guard, um, that year. And I remember I'm six, you know, I'm six, three and a half or whatever. And I remember I, the picture with my hand on top of his head. He's like five, six. Or Jermaine Calvin? Five, five or something. No, it was a guy on their team. On their team. Okay. On the other team. Yep. Drew some, oh, gosh. I, don't, I forget. But he's very small. <laughs> really good. Their best player. But at the end of the game, they got a picture of me having my hand on top of his head. I was pretty, <laughs> which was a horrible. That's a horrible moment for him, probably. But <laughs> it was, it was, I didn't mean to. I wasn't, I wasn't trying to be little him at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, pat um, the head as you, as you head off the floor, but yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just one of those things. Yeah. If he wasn't short, it would have made more sense. But <laughs> it, uh, he was a little guy. Yep. But then, um, you know, going into that Kentucky game, and obviously this would be our second time playing them in, the, in three years. Yeah. Um, you know, with Rondo and, and the cast, and I thought we, had, I thought we had a great game plan, um, for them. Um, I think. I think in, 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 if I'm honest, and I hope that's what you want me to be yes. at this point. Um, I think if I'm honest, we kind of, um, I think we, we, we didn't respond well. We didn't respond well in that game. Um, you know, I remember Shigari, the seven foot four guy that didn't play very many minutes in any of the previous games. He came in and really disrupted some things. And, um, you know, it was one of those things. That was, I think it, it might have been the first time that I saw Bogut like a little bit shook. Mm-hmm. Um, that was kind of like, like he's human after all moment. Um, and, and just, and, and then you just have to, have to remember he was just a sophomore. Right. So it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't like he was a fourth year, fifth year senior. That was, that I kind of been through that. He had experienced a high level of success and really, really thriving in those two years. And I think, you know, getting to that particular point and you just, you just saw he was human. You know, and that's that's just the best way I can put it. Um, and and I thought we I thought we still were, were able to to be close and stick around. And, and but at the end of the day, they just kind of they kind of got the best of us. And to be honest, I thought we underachieved that year. I really do. I thought we, I really had us having an opportunity to play in that final four that year with the guys that we had and and, and kind of the way that we played the game and, and even the uniqueness of Bogut and what he could do away from the basket. Um, as well as, you know, what he could do with his back to the basket and defensively. I mean, there was just so many things that I thought were great um, with that team. And, and I felt like I was a little disappointed. I mean, I mean you, you, obviously there's only one champion, but I, I was a little disappointed at, at how early that run ended for us. Mm-hmm. Um, because, I didn't, because I didn't think that it had to. I didn't think that, I didn't think it had to end that early. So um, that's, that's, one of the, that's one of the games. I don't have very many where I felt like we had more to give and we, and we, didn't, and we didn't give it. You know, it's interesting you say that because that's kind of what uh, I remember the sentiment being as well after that loss of Kentucky. And by the way, it was 67-58, the, the final score over Oklahoma. They moved Bogut to the high post at halftime, I think. And that's when, as you said, it was back cuts and, and layups yeah. against this Oklahoma team. It was very, very talented that year as a three seed. You pull this, the upset as a six. But, and there's years you play Kentucky as a six seed in the, in the Sweet 16. You're like, well, we're just happy to be here. But I agree that that team, to have a guy like Bogut who was so special and all the excellent pieces around him, shooters, uh, yeah. yourself a point guard, you had a lot of the things you need to have a run and, and to lose that game to Kentucky in Austin, it, it definitely felt disappointing. And I know a lot of people around the program kind of thought, you know what, this was a year where they thought maybe there was more – that that team could have done. It just didn't work out. And that's, that's the month of March, you know, you get one chance and, and sometimes it works out sometimes not, but a great run by that team again, sweet 16, a final ranking of 14th in the country, 29 and six. You guys went 13 and one to win the conference championship that year. And just a great season. Uh, unfortunately, Tim, you know, everyone points to that senior year in college and, and we knew that would be a, a challenging year with Bogut going to the NBA, Mark Jackson, leaving the, uh, you know, to graduation, Justin Hawkins transferred, uh, Richard Cheney, I believe left as well. It, it just seemed like at that point, that was a year where, you know, a lot of things just weren't going the right direction. And, and, uh, you did not finish years as a starter. I know you had some health issues yourself and it wasn't the end you were hoping for. I'm sure, you know, if you can just kind of summarize, how your career ended and, and, and how it all wrapped up for you in that, that final season in 05, 06. Yeah. Um, so I had a, I had actually had a pretty tough 
junior year. Yeah. And a lot of people were not aware of the stuff that I was dealing with in my junior year. Um, I actually lost a, lost a kid that year, which most people, and I don't even know if it's news to you, but, um, most people didn't know that. I did not know um, that until at the time yeah. I did not. Yeah. Yeah. In February. Yeah. So, um, that, that happened for me that year. Um, obviously there was a, a lot of team success, but there was a lot of grief on my right. end. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a 20 year old guy who, you know, I'm just trying to figure it out, you know, and then having something so tragic happen, um, was just a hard thing. And I felt like, um, once the season was over and once I had an opportunity to really get away and not be entrenched in it all, um, I think I just went through a pretty bad grieving process personally. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, it led to a lack of motivation. It led to, um, a, a crappy off season for myself personally. Um, you know, came back after that year, after that, after my, after that summer, came back overweight and came back out of shape and, and I had to fight my way back to, to some sort of, you know, playing, you know, playing, uh, shape. And then I had some, inter- in some injuries that, that didn't help that. Um, and so, you know, when I, when I, when I think about what, what it was for me personally, in terms of it being, kind of a down year, um, you know, I, I take the majority of the responsibility for that. Um, you know, I've, and I've never, I've never blamed anybody else but myself for that. Um, it was just some life stuff that I just could not seem to shake. And I've always been a happy, a happy guy and, and really don't, you know, wear my, um, feelings or, you know, I don't really wear that stuff on my sleeves. And so, um, you know, a lot of just bottling things up and, and they manifest it in a different way. Um, they manifest in a different way for me. And so that was kind of in a nutshell, the start of, of the end in terms of a decent career at Utah. Um, and so came back and like you said, didn't, didn't finish the year as a starter. Um, one of the cool things that did happen though, that year was, um, that was the year Johnny Bryant yep. became eligible. And, um, it was the year, um, you know, he's another guy from California, from Oakland. And, um, I was able to, um, take him under my wing because he was really more of a scoring guard, more Mm -hmm. of a two guard, but just undersized two guard. Um, but I remember, you know, countless film sessions with just he and I, and, you know, as he was getting moved to that role and, um, and I was not a two guard. I mean, there was nothing about my game that said I I needed to be on the wing and play the two. Um, but that was what, you know, that was what was being asked of me. Um, but in the meantime, you know, in order to try to, you know, help, help our team. You know, I remember taking Johnny under my wing and, and just showing them how to play the position and showing them how to think and show them what reads are and, and things of that nature. And, and, um, so that, that was really something really cool that came out of it. Um, never thought Johnny would be a coach. Never, ever, ever, ever thought he would be a coach. Um, but I think he was able to learn the game in a different light. Um, and obviously I'm not attributing any of his success to me, but, uh, I will say that I, I think that we that we found a light switch that allowed him to be a little more cerebral and to to really approach the game differently as a point guard than he probably would have if he if he'd just been a two guard his whole career. So um, that was really something cool that came out of that year. But all in all, it was a sucky year. Um, I hated it. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's how I felt about. <laughs> that's how, how I said about it. Up. Year. <laughs> yeah, you you brought up a great point about Johnny. Uh, I thought the same thing when I heard he was be- becoming a coach at the NBA level. I'm like, really? Uh, yeah. and, and towards the end of his career, I could see some things, you know, changing with him. Uh, now he's with the mm-hmm. Utah Jazz, and and I know you were a big influence on him. And I didn't want to bring up the the thought about your child. And I'm sorry again to 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 have you oh, have no, to hear you talk good. about that. I wasn't sure if you wanted to go there. You know, that year, Tim, to me, you weren't the same at times. You always uh, yep. were willing to talk to the media as you always have been. I mean, you were always a guy who never ducked an interview and never uh, made excuses. You always stood up and answered questions and took responsibility. Yep. But you weren't yourself. I knew the year was, was not going well. As, as you said, you were a little bit out of shape and health-wise you weren't your best. And I found out after the fact that, yeah, you had lost a child that year and and once I heard that, I'm like, well, it all makes sense now, you know? Um, so your personal issues on top of the, the team issues led to, uh, as you said, just a, a, a year you didn't want to have for your senior year. But the thing you always had, and that's, um, this will allow me to transition to kind of the next part of your story, is you always had your religion. 
Uh, I know you got involved in New Pilgrim uh, really from the moment you, you, you came to town. It's now called The Point. You were heavily involved in your church and, and music, and you had things away from basketball that you were into heavily uh, that that yeah. uh, were there for you your whole time here. You're still involved. You know, Tim, if you can't go back, and if I get too personal, just tell me so. But, you know, to lose a child is hard for, for anybody, no matter what your age is or circumstances, for you to, to lose a child. But you had your religion to help you through that time. Just just talk about the strength you found in your faith and and, and what helped you get through that, that difficult uh, moment in your life. Yeah. Um, I mean, you, I mean, you hit it on, on the head. I mean, it, it was definitely my faith. Um, it's always been my faith that has, um, that has kind of gotten me through, um, especially, I mean, times like that where, like I said, it, it was not something that, um, not, it's, it's not something I ever thought I'd imagine I would go through, right. um, at any point, point in my life. Um, and, and to, to be in that situation at such a young age, um, and to, um, to really have to rely on my faith. Um, my faith in God. Um, I don't, you know, and I, and I know people use that word loosely or whatever, use religion and stuff like that. Um, I don't have religion. <laughs> I don't really, you know, I mean, yeah, I'm a Christian and all that, but like it was, it was then that I started to develop a real relationship with Jesus. And, 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 and that in and of itself is, is what, um, is what pulled me through, um, myself and my pastor, Pastor Corey, um, we were great friends even to this day. Um, he's one of my best friends. He and his family um, st- stood very, very close by um, um, me in that time. My church family, um, they rallied around me. Um, and um, and it just, it was, it, it ended up being a moment that obviously we'll never forget, but um, it was one of the, one of the defining moments and turning points in my life. Um, you know, as hard as it was and, and, um, and as difficult as it was back then, I am now able to see, um, you know, a lot of people question, like, why does this happen? Why does that happen? And, and a lot of people have questions for God and, and they a lot of people are discouraged from asking questions. I never, ever would tell anybody, don't be, you know, do not be discouraged to ask questions because we're human. There's, we have a limited understanding. Um, and so, but now years later, um, I'm starting to understand why I went through some of those things. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it's played a huge part in, in where I am now, um, and where I've been and where I'm going, um, as it relates to the faith and, and, and what I do, um, in terms of just trying to reach people. So, um, yeah, huge. I mean, faith was, faith was everything in that time. My faith in my family was, was everything in that time. You know, one of the phrases I've always referred to Tim is, uh, do you find your life or does your life find you? And I've always hmm. thought it's kind of a combination of both. You know, we can't all occupy the same space. There's a plan for all of us. We're all given certain skills and talents and, and that those things lead us to a place. And then really it's kind of what, what are you passionate about? You know, your, your spirit, what, what do you really get into? And, and like I said, it's kind of a combination of you finding your life and your life finding you. And in terms of religion, I've always felt like, you know what, it's really whatever gives you comfort and a compass. And, and there's always religions around the world, but uh, it's really whatever works for you. And, and, and I know your church became, was always big to you, but during that time, as you just said, it was, it was, it was tremendously important to you and remains uh, important to this day. And, and uh, it got you to that point. And, and really, Tim, you know, you did play some basketball overseas. Uh, I know you're over in China for a while and, and you got your health kind of back under you and you, and you play, but from what I understand yeah. you were on a bus in China in 2010 and and you were playing some ball and, and you were still giving it a chance when really God came to you again and, and kind of called you home. Uh, if you can kind of yeah. just share that story with us and, and that really kind of takes us to where you are in the present day. But I thought that was a uh, kind of a pivotal moment for you to, to have that happen? No, that was huge. It was huge. It, is, it was probably the most pivotal moment of my life, to be honest. Um, out of all the things that have happened, um, that moment, that time, um, is what changed the trajectory of my life um, forever, um, forever. So, yeah, I mean, I was uh, that would have been my third season. I played in Finland first, and then I played in Mexico. I had a pretty decent career in Mexico, or a pretty decent season in Mexico. I think that's when I was in the best shape, <clears throat> Finland, I had to earn it, every bit of it. Um, and in Mexico, I, I was able to show up and, 
and be in great shape and uh, had a great season. And then we were actually on a tour in China. Okay. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's where, you know, they, they kind of put a, put a bus full of, um, American players that have a really, you know, great opportunity and chance to play overseas. And a lot of the Chinese, uh, teams in the, in the CBA, they want, you know, teams to come out and they want to get a look at, you know, a bunch of Americans at one time. And so that ended up with that, uh, that, that was what that was. And, um, we got about, I don't know, a three quarters of the way through that particular trip. And, and I was playing well, but the thing that I picked up on, um, and I pick up on people and I pick up on situations pretty, pretty good. Like I've, I've always been a, a really, I don't say a whole lot, uh, in the moment, but I, I kind of pick up on things and, and kind of know what's going on around me pretty quick. So in that particular situation, I, I recognized that it was 10 guys on our team and, and nobody was going to get a job in China. Like nobody. Right. Gonna, it doesn't, it didn't matter. I mean, we had guys who scored 30 in a game and teams were kind of like, Oh yeah, we really like you. And that type of thing. At the end of the day, it ended up being like these glorified scrimmages <laughs> so that these teams can get, you know, game against a really, really good American team. That's right. where it ended up being. Okay. And I figured that out pretty quick. Mm-hmm. So once I, once I determined that, I didn't stop playing. I didn't stop playing hard. It didn't turn me off. I was just like, okay, this is what this is. But I saw the response of the other guys who they, who were like distraught that that nothing was going to come out of it. You know what I mean? That that realization that okay, I really thought I was coming down here to, to sign and to, to get an opportunity to play in this league and and and, and really get my career going financially. And I, and I saw the guys around me responding and heard some of the conversations on that particular bus ride. Like, you know, guys in Chicago, like, Hey, um, you know, they're talking to guys that live in LA, which is where we took off from. They're like, Hey man, when we get back to LA, is it cool that I stay with you for a couple of weeks? Because my my family's not going to understand why I'm coming home because mm-hmm. I, I told them I was going to go to China and I was going to stay and, and I was going to get a job there. And so like to look at that level of disappointment and the level of like, man, I'm just really not, like I, I like basketball is everything to me. Like to to hear that being repeated and to see the sadness and in, in that moment, I was just like thinking to myself and I and you know and I don't ever want to appear like this spooky guy that like hears from God, right? Um, but for the first time in my life, it was like, man, it was so clear. Yeah. And I was and, and it just came to me. It was like, yo, like this is it for you. And and for me, I was like, what? Like. <laughs> Like, what does that mean? Like, it wow. wasn't a question. It wasn't like a, hey, consider this. It was like emphatically, like, this is it. You're done. Wow. There's something else for you to do. And in that moment, I had like immediate peace about it. It wasn't, and it was nothing I thought about before. It wasn't, you know, mm-hmm. this literally just came in that moment. And I'm just like, okay, all right. And I, and I, and I don't apologize for my faith. And I'm like, okay, this is God. This is, this is easy guy. And, and I already had passion for music and what I was doing in my church. So it wasn't like, you know, I didn't know what I was going to be doing, but I, I, I didn't know what my career was going to be. That was the part that I was like, okay, I'm done, but right. what is next? <laughs> right. What's next? Um, yep. Yeah. What's, what is it going to be? And so, um, when I came back to Salt Lake, um, we landed in LA, came back to Salt Lake and, um, my brother and his girlfriend at the time wasn't his wife yet. Um, they were, maybe it was his wife. It was his wife. It was his wife. They were involved in, um, in a thing called the Messiah. It's a, it's a play. It's a, it's a musical that they do around Christmas every year at Capitol Theater at the split campus in the, in Salt Lake. And I was like, man, shoot, I'm just going to go and, and watch my brother and my sister perform. You know, he was playing bass and she was singing in the choir and, and another one of my brothers was playing guitar. So I'm sitting there. And uh, there was a big choir and I sat there and I just started counting how many people were in the choir, just randomly. I mean, I wonder how many people are up there. It's kind of a big stage. Seems like a lot of people, but it could be deceiving. So I counted and it was like 80 people. I was like, whoa, that's pretty cool. You know, they got 80 people to sing gospel in, in Salt Lake City and they sound great. And <laughs> the whole bit. And so I'm just I'm sitting there just hanging and all of a sudden I'm like, I hear again, like, okay, this is what you're going to do you're going to start a choir. And I'm like, okay. Like, wow. <laughs> sure. You know, wow. So, so I go up 
I, this is this is I, I, I kid you not, man. Like this is this is what happened. I go up with intermission, and at that time, none of my family knew that I was playing basketball. That I was walking away. I don't want to call it retirement, but nobody knew that I was walking away from the game as a player. And uh, I walk up, and my sister and my brother are on um, on the stage, and I say, "Hey guys, I'm done playing basketball." They're like, "What? What are you doing? What are you talking about?" I got done doing. <laughs> They're like, okay, like, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to start a choir. And they're like, okay, cool, let's do it. Let me know. I'm in. They were all inside. <laughs> my brother and sister were just, they were stoked about it. Like, yeah. Kim's going to start a choir. Like, yeah. And I, I'm, as I'm, even as I'm saying it, I'm saying it without a plan. I'm saying it without really even thinking past the 10 minutes of counting choir members and, and saying that this is cool. Well, I said it to them. I went back to my seat and um, I get, my phone is buzzing during the second half of the concert and it's an email, right? But it's an email that I don't recognize, but it had my name and it said, uh, coach in Amsterdam. That's what it said. So I was like, what? Like I had, I knew that it was another tour coming up. So it was possible that, the, you know, so I'm like, okay, what is this? I open it up. This is all during this concert. I open the email and, um, there was a coach and he said, Hey Tim, this is coach so-and-so. Um, I am in, I'm, I'm involved with taking a team over to Amsterdam for a tour after Christmas and, or during Christmas. But, um, I heard through, um, through the other guy who took us to, to China, I heard that you were retiring from basketball. I heard that you were walking away from it. And I heard that it was due to your faith. And this is, this is a, this is a guy I've never met. Guy, I, I still can't, I can't even tell you his name today. But he said, I heard it was because of your faith. And I'm reaching out to you not to ask you to come to Amsterdam or to reconsider, but I'm reaching out to you to say thank you. Like, okay. Wow. What are you thanking me for a stranger. He's like, I'm reaching out to you to say thank you. I know this doesn't make sense, but a few months back, I lost a child to suicide. And I have, I claim faith in Christ as well. But obviously I've been struggling with that because I don't understand why God would allow my child to die and in this manner. But I also understand that through your faith, you just took a big leap in a direction that you don't know you're going. And so I wanted to say thank you because, because what I learned about you walking away from the game and it being because of your faith and basically blind faith is now giving me hope to believe that there is a reason why God took my child. So I'm thanking you for, for walking away from the game and using your faith. I'm, or I'm, I'm thanking you from walking away from something that you love as much as you do. I know that it's hard, but I know that whatever it is that you decide to do, it's going to be successful. How about that? My goodness. That was the message. And when I say that I sit there with like, I was just like, I don't even, I can't even describe it. I can't even describe it. It was, it was all of this confirmation came at one time and I can't make it up. I can't, you know I mean? I, I showed my brothers the email and I'm, I mean, because I am the way that I am, I probably have lost the email by now. But, <laughs> Um, <laughs> I, it was just, it was incredible. And there went, there I went and, uh, I guess the rest is history. Yeah. Like I said, uh, do you find your life or does your life find you? And at the time, some things right. don't make sense, but as you get down the road and, uh, have some time and some clarity and, and, uh, some other things come up, it, a lot of times you look back and you're like, okay, I understand now what that was. And it sounds like you've kind of had that moment. This coach had that moment and, and it led you in the right direction. Cause as I said, you'd always been, uh, you know, uh, into your music. You, you always had a strong faith. You were involved in new pilgrim as you were in college. And now here you are. So you, you hang up basketball. I know you still play a little bit in the side in the basketball tournament and some other things, but you've gotten yeah. into coaching. Now you were at Murray high school for a bit as an assistant. And now you're the AD and uh, basketball coach, Intermountain Christian, but uh, music is, is still huge. You are the music director at the point church, also the director of the Salt Lake city mass choir, 
uh, a diverse multi-generational group. And uh, I, I know you've had a great run with, with them. Maybe just talk a little bit uh, before we get to your current project about what you've done with the Mass Choir and, and your success with them. Yeah, we started the choir back in um, in 20, uh, 2010. We gathered some people around the city um, that I knew um, kind of had the same ideas in terms of starting a, a choir and having something a little bit different coming out of Salt Lake in that way. And, and um, we held three auditions, and we auditioned 120 people, which was crazy, um, that we were able to get that many people that were even interested. Um, and then from that, we started and formed a choir with... with um, uh, 90 people came to rehearsal for the first rehearsal. I was blown wow. away. It was, it was crazy. Um, and I'm still like, I, this is all new to me. Right. So I'm green and I'm walking in. I'm like, Oh, I guess we have to do this. People showed up, you know? <laughs> um, and so <laughs> anyway, fast forward a couple of years later, um, uh, reached out to a really good friend of mine and partner in, in the music business, uh, Jerry Harris, who's just tremendous, a, a great producer, great musician, um, really good dude and mentor. Um, in, in a lot of things that, that, that pertain to life, but reached out to him. He had just moved here. His wife, you probably, you probably know her, but yes. used to be the coach. Yep. Yeah. Valeda was the assistant coach at Utah and now the head coach at Weber State. Right. But, uh, her husband, Jerry, um, he just had a long, outstanding musical career and just really took me under his wing. And, and together we were able to, to produce and, and, and uh, co-produce a, uh, an album called All Praise, Salt Lake City Mass Choir. Uh, we recorded it three nights live uh, here at a local church, and um, we packed out every night, and and we were able to to release it with some with some executive production help from uh, some, some friends of ours, and uh, yeah, the project's been out since 2017. The total project's been out um, on iTunes and, and anywhere you can download music, Spotify, all that, and that's a great project. It's, it's really cool. Um, I don't listen to it much because I um, I'm very critical of myself. Um, but, but, um, an amazing, an amazing, um, testament and testimony of what, um, of what God has done in my life. Um, just through, just through listening and being obedient. Um, and so, yeah, we're still going, obviously the, the current situation we don't meet, um, uh, right now, but I, I can't wait to be able to get back together with those guys and, and, um, uh, and, and continue to make more music. You led me to a couple of things there, and wow, what a story! Um, to, uh, how that group came about, and the things you're doing, and uh, again, uh, wish you nothing but the best. Again, 2017, it's a live album with the Salt Lake City Mass Choir that uh, has done very well, and and uh, that kind of brings us to the current day, Tim. It, it's it's been uh, a stretch of time the past two and a half, three months that is is just been unbelievable. I mean, every day you turn around and yeah. you hear about the things going on with the coronavirus, and and then the situation uh, in Minneapolis with George Floyd a few weeks ago, with him dying at the hands of police officers as he's being taken into custody and in, in the outbreak, and and we'll get to that in just a moment. But uh, and what you're doing to try to help us all through that, but. You know, Tim, you've been a victim of racism yourself uh, during your days as a basketball coach in the state of Utah, and I won't get into the details. It's, it was well covered, but um, I want to get to you on this, you know, as, as you watch the things that have been going on with, and, and we've had situations going back to, to 2014 in Ferguson, Missouri, where there's been black men dying at the hands of, of white cops. And uh, I can give you some numbers that are just staggering. Uh, in fact, a black person is killed by a police officer in America at the rate of more than one every other the day since 2015. I mean, there's some numbers that are just staggering. As you watch these things happen, and, and more specifically, the recent situation in Minneapolis as a, as a man who's been uh, at the hands of racism yourself in your lifetime, what are, the, what are some of the things you think? What, what's going through your head, Tim, as you see this all unfold? Yeah. Um, and like you said, you know, not going to, into too much detail, but as I look at um, my situation in comparison to what um, has happened um, to George Floyd here recently. And, and like you said, you know, every other day to, um, to black men since 2015, um, I look at those, those things in comparison to what I went through and realize that um, that very well could have been me um, in, in that, in that same situation, in that context. Um, with with law enforcement involved and um, with race playing a part in in that in my situation, um, what I realized I could have easily ended up the next guy. Um, yeah, 
this. And so it obviously can be cool again. Um, come on, it's like it it wasn't like I didn't know that it existed. But it, it it's something that um you know now that now that it's in my life it's something that's a little bit closer to me. Um and it's something that uh is very real. You know, it's hard to live it's hard to live um in fear and 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 with your guard up every single day of your life. And and I've chosen for the most part of my life not to live that way. Not necessarily because I, I didn't think that, that things were possible or not necessarily that, you know, because I don't think I had a reason, but it was just for my own peace of mind. Um but with the recent things that have happened, um, it kind of forces you in a way to to think about it past what um what you would. And so that's what the situation that I went through um and, and now, you know, to present day with all the things that have happened between now and or then and now is is um is kind of where I'm at. It's been quite this stretch of time. I mean, as I mentioned, the coronavirus and the shutdown of our nation and the economy for, you know, the better part of two and a half months and then and then the killing of George Floyd on May twenty fifth. You know, Tim, there's been too many instances. I mean, one is too many, but there have been a lot of cases like George Floyd situation going back to, to 2014, even before. But this situation has felt different uh, really from day one uh, with the situation in Minneapolis and just the response of people. I mean, you watch, uh, you know, television nights, CNN, all the networks, MSNBC, so so on and so forth. And, and there are protests and, and, you know, every city across the country, it's white people, it's black people, it's young, it's old. It's, there's been this tremendous reaction, uh, to this situation that, that, that really has, has been unprecedented. Um, you know, Tim, as you watch it, uh, you know, why do you think the reaction this time around has been so different? Cause you hear a lot of people saying, you know what, we're not going to let this one go. Um, yeah. the time for change yeah. is now, uh, why do you think this situation and the response has been so different than what we've seen the past five to six years in these circumstances. Yeah. You know, I think, um, and I didn't, I still haven't to this day. I still have not watched the complete video. Um, it's really hard for me to read, um, what it is that he said in, in those last you know moments of his life. Um, and then watch it live. I, I just, Knowing that those things were said is enough for me, and and maybe one day I'll bring myself to actually watching the complete video. Um, but the entire nation um, was able to see it and was able to hear it in real time. Um, they were able to watch it, and it wasn't from a from a long distance away. Um, but I think they were able to also watch. The callousness, if that's a word, I think it is. I went mm-hmm. to school. I hope it is. Yep. Of of the police officer, um, who who um, for eight minutes and, and eight minutes plus, um, was able to publicly in broad daylight um, choke the life out of a, out of another man, um, and and the and the look on his face, um, the um, the blatant disregard for that life, um, as it was being begged for, um, the blatant in action of his colleagues. Um, I think, I think that as all of those things that are in that video and then coming right off the heels of the Ahmad Arbery, um, situation. And then coming off the end in the Breonna Taylor situation. I mean, you have these things that, you know, in succession and then, and then you kind of top it off with the George Floyd thing. And it's like, I think, I, I think everybody sees that enough is enough. I think mm-hmm. that's the first thing. Um, I think that's everybody has resolved. And when I say everybody, for sure, people of color, but we've, I mean, we've been saying that for a long time. Enough is enough. enough, is enough. When, when will it stop? Will it end? But I think the thing that is driving um, this movement um, as it is today is the fact that now, um, there are, there are people, um, there, there are white allies that also have had the opportunity or had the, 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 the sucky opportunity to watch that video 
And now they're like, okay, no, you know, there's, there, there is, there's hope in humanity in the fact that, okay, this isn't right. And while we're on this, neither was all the other stuff, you know, that, that wasn't right. And so I think now it's bigger, it's, it's more heard, it's more recognized because it's not just black people who are saying it. I think you have, um, you have, you have police departments all around the country who stood up and said, Nope, that's not okay. Um, that are very, ver- that, that, that were very verbal about it. Um, you have people who typically would sit in silence and just kind of let it blow over. Not are now saying something you have the, obviously social media plays a huge part in it. Um, where now, um, what people are doing and saying, and even what people are not saying is being exposed. Um, and it's bringing our nation, um, to a point of, you know, there's, it's, it's time to change. Mm-hmm. And, and, and people are saying it out loud. Like we will not stop. We will not give up on this one because everybody senses, okay, this is the moment. I mean, as an athlete, you know, you get, sometimes you get in games and, and you're like, you know, it may, maybe it's a hard fought game is going back and forth, but there's a moment in that game where you decide like, no, no, like this is, we won't stop. You, we go on a run and you feel like, okay, this is that moment and you can't let up. There's no way you let up. And that's what it feels like. That's what it feels like at a, at a, at a higher scale, a higher level. Um, I mean, even the people who have responded that, uh, that didn't do it in a way, um, that was, that was really right or lawful. I mean, with the riots and, and those things, like, I don't agree with the riots. I don't agree with, you know, what people have done to businesses and things like that, but I don't give that very much energy. And I think, and, and the reason, the reason why I don't give it much energy is that I also understand based on my situation of what it means to be hopeless and helpless and fed up. And when people don't listen and when people don't hear you, I understand what that resolve is. And it takes, you know, some, sometimes it manifests differently for different people. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, that stuff is wrong, but I understand it. I understand it because I can't understand it because I'm a person of color and I understand what it means to have your back against the wall and, and for no one to come to your defense and for there to be blatant things that happen over and over and time and time again and all in the, in the blatant like disregard for life. And you figure, you know, fine. You know, you didn't hear me. Now I don't want you to hear me. <laughs> I want yep. you to feel me. And so I think that has been, you know, the response in those situations as, as wrong as it is. And again, I, I'll never condone that. I'll never condone burning down businesses. I'll never, I mean, I was alive for the LA riots, you know, with Rodney King. And I remember being in Los Angeles and the streets were hot and, you know, people were burning down bills. I was there during that time. And I remember how afraid I was. And I remember how much I didn't understand um, what was going on. But I think a combination of all these things, and I've, and I've seen now, you know, so many, so many more peaceful protests, you know, people are waking up in the morning. And I, there was one in Salt Lake at six o'clock this morning, and they're just going on all of, not just all around the country, but all around the world. And so mm-hmm. now you have the world looking at you, right? Now we have the eyes of of the Italy's and the Brazils and the France. And then the, I mean, and the list goes on. They're like, okay, America, what are we gonna do? And and there's no option. The, the option to not do anything that 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 that's not an option anymore. And so I I, I feel very excited about the fact that that real change is going to come. Yeah. I, you make up a lot of, or you make a lot of great points there, Tim. I, I think it is sort of a, a cumulative effect. I mean, all the, the pent up frustration, this COVID-19 uh, virus has impacted the black population more than, than any other. I mean, uh, the numbers are there. 23% of those who've died uh, are black. Um, you know, 30% of the population is African-American. So, you know, 13 to 23, that's, that's a, a pretty, sizable gap there between the percentage of the population and those who have died from this disease. You look at the unemployment numbers, the black population more impacted than any other. Um, you know, Tim, we're, reco- we're recording this the afternoon of June 10th, and, and we're two weeks past the uh, the death of, of George Floyd. He was laid to rest in Houston yesterday. I remember last a week ago today, Tim, I'm watching uh, the cable news shows late at night, and this was sort of a poignant moment to me. It's in your hometown of L.A., Curfew had come, and there were people, black and white, who were willing to be arrested to make a point. And the cops came and one by one led them away in handcuffs or in the in the, the zip ties to take them away, and, and yeah. the people were fine with that. And it was peaceful. 
It wasn't violent. Uh, we saw last weekend that the violence had, had largely left the protests. They were very peaceful over the weekend. The numbers were the biggest they'd ever been since this, this situation came upon us. But to just watch that scene in L.A., to have people who were willing to be arrested to make a point, and, and that's yeah. continued, and it has continued, and it just seems like we're at a point now where maybe enough people have had enough, and they've had time to watch this. And, yeah, the, the, the images – uh, the video of, of of George Floyd dying at the hands of police is pretty powerful, and uh, it yeah. stayed with a lot of people. And, and perhaps maybe this is what has to happen. Maybe this is how it needs to happen. You look back at the history of our nation and other and, and the entire world for that matter. What what brings you to change? And it's it's usually the culmination of a lot of things that come together. And all of a sudden, you have your flashpoint. You have the moment where it really happens. And we might be there. Um, it's going to take some time, yeah. but there's legislation that's that's being drawn up on at the national level uh you hear cities talking about we need to make change locally and maybe this is where it happens but you know you you, you listen to people you you hear from people and it seems like everyone is looking for um a, a way to do something and you and your brother terrence uh who's yeah. in the music industry ha- came up with a great idea and uh you came out with a song uh, a couple weeks ago and as i watched it one saturday night on youtube I'm like, I, I've been meaning to have Tim on this podcast, and as soon as I saw it, I, I sent you a text right away. I said, Tim, i got to have you on to talk about this because I thought the message was so good. So let's take a break. Let's get your brother Terrence on the line. We'll bring him in. We'll come back with more in just a moment. This is the Utes Insider presented by Pepsi. For more on Utah athletics, including up-to-date schedules and ticket information, log on to utahutes.com. Now back to more of Utes Insider presented by Pepsi. Welcome back to more of Utes Insider presented by Pepsi. Mike Lagas show joined by a former running Ute Tim Drisdom on this show. And and before we stepped away to, to bring in Tim's brother Terrence, we were talking about uh, the situation with uh, the coronavirus outbreak and and the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis back on May 25th and, and just sort of the, the confluence of events in our nation's history. And uh, so I'm doing what most people have done. You're stuck at home. You're watching TV. You're on social media. And about 10 days ago, I was on uh, Facebook and saw a post made by Tim with a link to YouTube of a song that uh, he and his brother Terrence just came out with called Hold On. And Terrence goes by Ernie as his stage name. It's it's under him. If you want to go to YouTube and search it up, it's it's called Hold On by Ernie. I saw the song. I love the message. And I reached out to Tim right away and said, I got to have you on this podcast. And so Tim said, yeah, I'll do it. Let's bring Terrence are with me. So, you know, Tim, I'll start with you and, and Terrence, you can, you can jump in as well. Guys, I love the song. The message is so important uh, in this day and age about uh, holding on and, and, and working through it together. So Tim, I'll start with you. Where did the inspiration from the song kind of get you started? And, and when did this process start for you guys? Yeah, so we um we and we talked earlier about about the incident that uh that I was directly affected by um a couple years ago. And um the song um as as it is today came out of that particular experience. Um I actually after the trial that we went to for that particular situation, um I actually found my way to a uh to a piano that night. And um, and I wrote the very first part of um, of the song "Hold On," as you know it, uh, and as you as you've heard it already. So that's kind of what uh, where the song came out of. And then through the coronavirus and the quarantine stuff, Karen works so hard um, in the studio. He's there every day producing music and working with different artists and um, doing his own music. And um, so I just popped in one day. It might have been a Monday, and um, we just started talking and then all of a sudden, you know, we started building the track for this song and it wasn't like, you know, it was, it was more of like, let's just have some fun and make some music and hey, got to get some ideas down. And then as the song started to, um, to evolve, then it was like, man, okay, well, let's do this. And just kind of went on from there with the, with the process. And, uh, I don't know, I'll let, I'll let parents tell the, the story from there. No, nah, um, <laughs> That's basically what happened, yeah. Uh, we just sat in, and we've always wanted to make music together just uh, as a family in general for years and years. We've uh, grown up singing together, and they all play instruments. I, I'm not gifted in that sense, and so um, me, it was just making making beats. So he brought it in, and, and uh, we started working on it, and 
from then on, um, I thought it was just a song for him because I remember when he first wrote it and uh, then he asked me to, to put a verse on it, the first verse on it. And so I was like, okay. And then uh, did it. Uh, I think he liked it. And then um, he was like, uh, put another one on. And I was like, for what? Uh, and he basically he told me he kind of had an idea after thinking about it uh, for a couple of days and uh, that he wanted to do this with all of us and so when he said that um i kind of started just coming up with some ideas on how to incorporate me him and uh my other brothers and uh our sister-in-law and so i kind of just what came of it um it started to make sense more as time went by because of everything that just kept happening you know after the other and so um eventually uh, towards the end of it we were like okay we kind of just have to do this um, for everybody um, to hear because as much as it was, you know, touching us and, and um, allowing us to feel a certain way, listening to it and, you know, lifting us up, we, we we felt that, you know, everyone needed to feel the same exact way because we were all going through the same thing around the world. So um, that's kind of what happened. And here we are. Well, it's a wonderful piece of music. So, you know, Terrence and Tim, from start of the process to the point where you release this, uh, how long did it take you from start to finish? From start to finish, when did we start? The first week of coronavirus, which was like March the, I don't know. Back in mid-March, around the 15th, 16th? Yeah, like mid-March. Yeah, yeah, so the song itself in terms of like all of the parts recorded um, to where we knew exactly you know, the direction and the song was gone and what it was going to say, that took a week. Um, that that yeah. took a week. And so we were done and probably not even a full week. We were, we were finished with the song itself in like four days um, with, with, um, with background vocals and Terrence, all the Terrence's verses were done and, and all of that. And then um, after a while, and so then we were trying to figure out what to do with the song. So yeah. like, do we give it? Do we give it to? Do we do we shop it out to somebody with a bigger platform that can get this out to the masses? You know, uh, in a in a pretty pretty quick way. Um, and so we toyed with that idea for like I don't know a couple of hours. Made some phone calls to see if we could, you know, get some more A list um, artists on the song. Because we figured if we liked it, they'll probably like it. We feel like we got a pretty decent ear for music, but we know we don't have the platform that gets the song to the masses. But after those couple hours of deliberation, we decided that we wouldn't sell it and that we would, or not sell it, but give it away. I don't know however that goes. I've never sold a song. But we would never, we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't give it away. But that we would also, um, after the Ahmaud Arbery thing, we were like, yo, we got to do a video. Because we also understand that, like, people are drawn in by music, but if they have something to look at while they're listening to the music, then it, it, it'll make so much more sense. Um, and then the other part of that was it's an opportunity because of, of how hard Terrence works. Um, it's an opportunity to um to open the eyes of, of the world to this new gift that is Terrence, um, because he's got a ton of, you know, a, a, so much more to offer to the world in terms of positivity, in terms of um just conscious music that that really, really sounds good. He's the most talented brother out of all of us. And that that is um I mean these I have some talented some talented brothers, but um this this was an opportunity for us to say, hey T like, like, give your gift to the world. Let's do it together. That's that'll be fun in and of itself. And um, you know, it's slowly starting to starting to pick up some traction, and um, we're excited. Well, it sounds great. And Terrence, you've got a couple other songs out there on iTunes and SoundCloud called "Smooth" and "Summertime." But this particular number again is called "Hold On" under the artist Ernie E R N E. You can find it on YouTube. But you know, Terrence, this time around, uh, you know, again, you've done some work on your own, but to get brother Tim involved, your other brother, CJ, wife and niece on this project. What was it like to, to sort of make this a family thing this time around for you? I loved it. Um, it was, 
you know, usually I'm in here by myself uh, every day. So just to have other people in here, <laughs> um, it felt it felt good, you know, it felt good to have some company. But, um, you know, doing this with my family, uh, it means everything. You know, like I said, we, we've always grown up doing music together and stuff like that, you know, never uh, on this scale, but just, you know, at the house singing, you know, they're playing, you know, I'm doing what I can. But uh, it felt good, you know, and, it, and and especially as we all are older now and um, more conscious of what's going on, for me being the youngest, um, you know, being able just to, to interact with, with them on a creative level uh, such as this and being able to present this to the world, you know, as a family, uh, it really does mean everything. I had a lot of fun doing it. Um, I hope we can do more stuff like this um, because, you know, this is just something that creates memories and uh, memories last forever. So, yeah, I was, I was excited. I'm still excited. And, you know, I hope there's more to come. All right, the song is Hold On by the artist Ernie. And here it is, Terrence Drizdom, along with uh, former youth Tim Drizdom. Hold on right here. Trying to mend relations because addiction had a soul. It's a long road to get where we belong, but the journey makes us strong and trouble never lasts too long. It's what we come to. Yeah. I've been looking for the love. The devil trying to hold me up. I got my foot up on his neck while I look to God above. I know that in this battle I've already but in won. In these times of great despair, look to the one and cash your care. I know it's hard, but just hold on. Kobe left us, he's supposed to be a closer Whole world upside down, fighting battles with corona Seems to be premature, but maybe it's the real exposure uh, Put in perspective, everybody got their motive But only pure intentions make it sit right with your soul We was made with hearts and gold Guys, uh, again, thoroughly enjoyed it We'll we'll not play the whole thing for you right there uh, You can go on YouTube and check it out yourself Again, it's called Hold On by the artist Ernie and uh, the lyrics that really kind of jumped out to me, guys, it's a long road to get where you belong or where we belong, but the journey makes us strong and trouble never lasts too long. And, uh, you know, in this time of day with so many things going on with the coronavirus and, uh, and the death of, of George Floyd and the things that have happened since then, it's, it's really a situation where we all are really just trying to hold on. And during the song, you mentioned addiction and some other things and, and really, if you, uh, the message I took was, you know, just hold on, hold on for one more night, for one more day, for one more week, and, and we'll get through this. And, you know, Terrence and Tim, and Tim, I'll start with you as you guys wrote this song and put it out. You know, what was the message you were hoping to convey with this piece of music? Well, it sounds, it sounds like, um, sounds like the message that we were hoping to convey at least hit one person and you might, <laughs> um, cause you, you hit it on the head. I mean, um, you know, it, it is, it's a long road, you know, to get where we belong and, and where we belong is together. We belong to, we, we belong in a relationship with one another. We belong in a respectful, um, place of understanding. I mean, all of those things. And that takes, that takes, that takes time. Um, so, you know, holding on is really the only thing you can do in the meantime. Like that's literally all you can do. You got, well, you got two choices. You can hold on or you can give up. So since we know that we're going to be in this for a while, the encouragement is let's let's take the let's take the high road and let's hold on together. And while we hold on, we affect change and we, we're a part of things that that help us to move forward. So that's kind of that's the message that that I feel like. I mean, yeah, from my perspective, we were trying to communicate. Terrence, how about you? Uh, for me, you know, we're sitting in history right now, and um, you know the. The, the more of the message is to hold on as you know the, the title is and uh and that's just not just you know what's been going on recently you know not with just the death and and you know social injustice and, and coronavirus and it's just it's really everyday life whatever you know each person is going through um in everyday life that's that's the that's the real message is just hold on you know because we all face our different battles and um you know we all handle them in different ways and so uh, if we can just get through it and 
you know, hold on, then um, we'll all be better for it individually. But as a whole, also as a community, as a as a nation, as a world, we'll be better for it. Um, you know, but it you know it, it takes some time. Everything doesn't happen right away, and so that that is the message to hold on. Well, guys, the message is wonderful, and and I don't, I don't think there's any question. We're going to look back on the stage of time. Uh, uh, and, and look at it as really, uh, I, th- I think, a pivotal point in, in the history of, of our nation, our world, and and uh, to see the things going on. I think we do have a chance for some change that is that is long overdue. Um, you know, Terrence, I asked Tim this before we came to you, but I'll ask you as well. You know, as you watch the protests going on across the country, across the world, and uh, it does seem like there is some momentum for change right now, real change. Uh, do you have hope that that maybe this this can be a turning point? for us i always have hope um you know i think we should all live for hope of something better you know and um sometimes things don't you know they don't look like they're going to change uh right away or even you know down the line but you know having hope is what you know i think makes us all human um it's what keeps us going every single day is, is that we have hope for something more and so I definitely have hope for change. I, I'm starting to see it, you know, uh, the decisions that uh, are being made around the country as far as like, you know, uh, laws and, and, and people in higher places that are making decisions for our country. I'm starting to see it. And, you know, it's a great thing to see. I just, you know, hope and pray that, you know, it continues to go in the right direction and that of all things that we just have a pure heart in all of our decisions that we make uh, because, you know, that's the most important thing. I think, you know, if it's, if it's pure, if the intentions are pure, then, you know, there, there won't be any type of, uh, regret or, or backlash from it because, you know, you know, deep down the reason why you make those decisions. And so, uh, I definitely have hope for our country. I have hope for our world. And, you know, I have hope for each individual that, uh, they'll find a way and we all will find a way collectively to, to make this world better for all of us to live in. Well, guys, I know everyone, uh, a lot of people I know at least, are looking for a way to to contribute something, whether it's protesting or organizing movements or simply voting. Uh, you know, there there are ways all of us can can uh, play a part in this and and hopefully make things better in the end. And uh, guys, your song has a great message. Uh, I really took to the message uh, that it was trying to convey. And and great work, guys. So, Terrence, great to meet you. Thanks for dropping by. Thank you. Nice to meet you as well. Thanks for having me. And the song again is, yeah, thanks for coming on. It's called Hold On by the artist Ernie, which is what Terrence goes by. Terrence Drism, it features former Ernie Newt Tim Drism, as well as her brother CJ and wife and niece. And, you know, Tim, before I let you go, I really appreciate you coming on this show. It's, you know, it's crazy the people you meet in life. I always say it's life isn't about the road you travel, but those you share the road with. And and I look mm-hmm. back at at the time you and I were around the basketball program together to you. It was, those were a lot of fun years and, um, you were a leader then, you're a leader now, and I'm not surprised at all to see you doing the things you're doing uh, with your coaching and, and being around young people and uh, the role you play with your church and your music. And, and this song, just to me, is is really kind of a, a flashpoint of who you are as a person. So I'm proud to say I know you and uh, proud of what you've done and uh, continued success, Tim, and we appreciate you dropping by the show. Mike, uh, it's always a pleasure. I appreciate you um, reaching out to me. And um, I'm giving this opportunity to to go back and, and talk about the fun stuff and uh, even some of the not so fun stuff. But it, it's why we're here. So a lot of fun. I, again, I really appreciate it. And uh, all the best to you, Tim. Hi, you too. Thank you. All right. That's Tim Driz and former running you. Tim, we'll come back to wrap things up in just a moment. This is Utes Insider presented by Pepsi. Stay connected by searching for Utah Athletics on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Now, back to more Utes Insider, presented by Pepsi. Well, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Tim Drism, our former running Ute point guard from 2002 to 2006, and his brother Terrence Drism hopping on. Those two collaborate on the song, Hold On. It's released under the artist Ernie, which is what Terrence goes by. It's on YouTube. Check it out. The song has done very well in a couple of weeks, and great to catch up with Tim. Uh, you know, he, he opened up about some things. I, I heard after he left the program that he had lost a child his his last year. And as I told Tim during the interview, I knew 
you just weren't the same that year, and I didn't know exactly why, and I knew things weren't going well for him on the court. You know, he was not in the best shape. He had some injuries as a result, and and I knew some things weren't right with him, but I heard after the fact, uh, about a year after he left, that it, it was uh, the loss of a child that was really weighing on him so much. But and I tell you the thing about Tim, and I mentioned this top of the show, he was always a guy who was a leader, always willing to do the interviews. I mean, we had some some tough losses his senior year, and he was one of the guys the media kept saying, hey, we want to talk to Tim, and I would go to the locker room and, and say, Tim, do you want to come out and talk? And he never once told me no. Always willing to say what had to be said, never shied away from things, and always showed tremendous leadership. And and uh, so I'm not surprised to see him become who he's become, a uh, very spiritual person, a uh, very charismatic person, very caring person. And and uh, Tim Drizm, uh, a guy who has who's done some wonderful things with his life. You know, there, there are guys he played with who've made a lot more money than he has in business. And Andrew Bogut's made billions playing in the NBA. But Tim, I tell you what, in terms of making an impact on young people in his role as an AD and a basketball coach and with his music and his church, uh, he is a guy who's made tremendous impact on a lot of lives. And I, I think the message he and his brother Terrence have produced with the, the song Hold On and and uh, just kind of the message they, they, they gave us is, is something that can help us through these tough times. And, and Tim's certainly a guy who is, who's making a difference and I think will continue to do so in his roles in our community. Well, that will do it for this edition of Utes Insider. If you've got a, an idea for a guest, reach out to us on Twitter at Utah Athletics. You can also send me an email to mlages at husband.utah.edu. We're back with more shows as we work our way through June and July. That will do it for now. Until next time, so long, everybody. This has been Utes Insider presented by Pepsi. To hear more episodes of this show and other Utah athletics podcasts, search for them on iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube.